It's the right time at the, the right point in the transaction, even prior to an entry, but then still maintaining, and this is important, the traditional parties, that you need that importer, that broker, those couriers, the express folks to have that right to make entry. Before we get started with the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Global Training Center. As trade compliance professionals, you want to make sure that your procedures and documentation are completed as correctly as possible to avoid any delays and possible fines. We provide a range of trade compliance courses that will fit your needs. From in-person or web training to recorded on-demand courses, we can train one or even thousands on your team through your learning platform or on our portal. We can even customize a private session for your team. Go to globaltrainingcenter.com to find out more. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Um, As you all know, this is our birthday week. I'm going to call it our week. It's actually, I guess a show can't have a birthday. It'd have an anniversary. (laughs) But anyway, so we're um, celebrating a whole year, by the way. So that's that's awesome. And uh, what we decided to do, Andy and I have been talking about uh, taking feedback from people. We just we just came back from G Tech as we record this. You know, we uh, we're about a week and a half out, um, and so we we talked about it and got some feedback, and we said, okay, let's create. People kind of want to see specialty shows. They want to see or hear us cover different things, and this is one of them. This is one of the ones that we're creating. Uh, it's a government affairs show. You know, just to get a little more detailed on. Any laws and regulations, Andy? You probably be able to explain this a little better, but but um, I mean, this was uh, something you decided we or came up with. So, yeah. Well, it's folks. One of the things I think that uh, we're looking at, we're still going to have our weekly show that we're interviewing different people. We have a second show that's called our weekly roundup, which is we're commenting on three uh, news articles that were published for that week, and so it's current type affairs. And we're doing some other things. This show I'm really excited about because it's uh, regulatory and industry affair type things. It's legislative. It's uh, regulatory. It is, you know, offensive, defensive type if issues. So the scenario there that everybody and their dog out there makes comments, they should be doing this issue, that issue, whatever. This is one of those that I want to look at to start diving in. It's like, see, what are the top regulatory and industry affairs type issues that are associated with Congress or with the agencies? And the second thing about that is, and we'll zero in not only on the whole agenda, but we'll zero in on a specific topic and go into it in a little bit more detail for you. We're not going to go a whole lot into the lot, a lot of background on the issue, but more of, okay, if you're for it, here's the issue. If you're against it, here are the other talking points with it. And then the other thing that I'm really excited about is I want to start talking about what is the what are the actions that you as an a an individual as a company uh, employee as a leader in your own company in the industries and those things what should you be doing who should you be talking with is it with the agency with the staffers with the representatives or senators and those kinds of things so I'm really excited about this one especially this first. Uh, this first show, as we get into uh, this guest here, is somebody that is a personal uh, friend, a colleague, and somebody that I've known for a long time. And uh, it's uh, Lalo and I both uh, enjoy his company anytime we get around him. But uh, um, Lenny Feldman is uh, one of the finest people I've ever had the opportunity to meet. He's just a great, great guy, and lots of folks know him, but uh, you can't miss this long, lanky dude when he comes in through strutting through the, the, the uh, you know, seminars and the conventions and stuff, right? <laughs> and he's, he's easy, and he's easy to spot because when you're looking over a crowd, when we were at GTEC, you look over a crowd, you just look at the tallest head and you're like, okay, there's Lenny. <laughs> I love it. Lenny, welcome to the show, my friend. It's uh, I'm looking forward to us getting into some discussion. But once you, uh, for those that may not uh, know you, why don't you give a little background on yourself and, and uh, what you're up to nowadays? Absolutely. Well, thanks for that warm introduction, Andy and Lalo, my friends. Uh, yes, we have some great memories and more to come. It's been, what, between sharing some beers on the road, waffles, pizza, um, we have lots of stories and, and good times. Uh, the speakeasy too. That was that was a fun night. Speakeasy. That, we could do a whole session on uh, you know after hours uh, at your conferences. Pick a city, right? Because you know that's the great thing about our industry, right? It's so collegial. 
Um, I call them my work family, and I mean that. It's more family than work. And so it's so good to be here. Congratulations, by the way, guys, on your one year. I think one year milestone means you're walking, right? At this point, you learn how to walk. So you're going from crawling to walking, and we have a, a lot of walking to do in the regulatory and legal side. So um, I've been blessed with a, a really exciting and awesome uh, career in customs and trade. I actually knew in law school, I wanted to be a customs and trade attorney and consultant. And my law school friends joke around, Lenny, you're the only one who said you were going to do a certain kind of law 30 years ago and you're still doing it. So that's how passionate I am about it. And uh, right after law school, I found my way into the Office of Regulations and Rulings. That's that office that issues those rulings you find on Cross. You might be familiar with the Cross system. They issue rulings, decisions, negotiate trade agreements. I was involved with negotiating the NAFTA part one back in the 90s, and then involved in implementing uh, Customs Modernization Act, part one again. And we were looking at automation, part one with ACE all in the 90s. And here we are 30 years later. And uh, I spent two years then working and managing a software development company, uh, which we were trying to provide logistics solutions and content to advise companies what the regulatory and legal requirements would be globally. And now I've been with the firm of Sandler, Travis and Rosenberg for over 20 years. Talk about a family in a great environment. We just have so much fun at STNR. We, we love seeing y'all on the road. And um, we have now about 90 folks working with us throughout the world, primarily in the U U.S., but we're also in Asia and throughout the Americas. And we are just focused on customs and trade. You know, that is our swim lane. That is what we do. And um, I'm especially honored to serve as a managing partner and owner of STNR, where I'm responsible for the strategic and financial direction of the firm and making sure we're all serving our, our clients in the industry and advocating really well. So uh, that's a little bit about me. And um, I'm looking forward to this, guys, big time. I've had my eyes on your show, and I was really psyched when you grabbed me and said, let's do it. So let's make it happen. Hi, everyone. Are you loving our podcast? Do you feel like watching instead of just listening to our episodes? We have started to share our podcast videos on our trade community, www.crowd.trade, where you can view the complete show, comment, and carry conversations with your peers. We have built a trade community around our training courses and different resources for you to collaborate and gain the knowledge you are looking for. Head over to crowd.trade and register for your free account. Let's start trading. Well, I love this. I love it. And it's, I will say, uh, is uh, Lee uh, still uh, kicking around there and, and involved or he's uh, taking more of a hands-off approach nowadays? Yeah, a lot of you probably know Lee Sandler and Tom Travis. Um, they are the founders of the firm and they are still very much a part of the firm. Uh, just recently, they said, you guys manage it, you take it over. But, uh, you know, we're, we're there when you need us and when you don't need us. And I talk to them regularly because they're just such great mentors, uh, to me and so many in the industry. So uh, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those guys and a lot of my colleagues, of course, who, who joined me in running the firm. So, yep. They, he's there. They're there. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of respect for both of those uh, fellows. Lee has been uh, also a good friend as well, and and over time and and whatnot. All right, so we're going to get into something here. Is uh, one of the things is you are uh, newly elected, I believe, or have you been in the role for a little bit with Coac? So let's talk about the Coac piece, which is really cool. Um, I technically just finished my second uh, term of COAC. So what that means, COAC the advisory group. So there are 20 people from the trade community. There'll be importers, exporters, express, brokers, forwarders, shipping lines, who 20 of us who advise CBP, Homeland Security and Treasury. It's an appointment technically by the secretaries of those departments and the customs commissioner. I did it for six years, finished that up. The second three years, the COAC was crazy enough to vote me as one of their co-chairs. Uh, I said, no, you don't want the lawyer to be the co-chair. It should be an import expert. I said, no, you're the one who gets along with all of us and could help us facilitate and get on the same page. So I said, I'll do it. Okay. So I did that for three years. And although now I'm not technically on the COAC, yes, I'm still very involved in the working groups. 
um, the, which you are able to do. And by the way, for those of you out there, it's a great way to get engaged with customs in the industry. If you could sign up for a working group, that's how you kind of start. Then you get onto the advisory group and then it's kind of how you flow afterwards. You know, you could still be on some working groups on the COAC and have a lot of interface there. So COAC, it, is it, was it customs operational advisory group? Isn't that what it says? Pretty much the, the, um, Commercial Customs Operations Advisory Committee that they really are advising on the commercial ops. Um, they don't get into, you know, the border patrol issues as much unless it impacts commercial operations coming over the border. But it's everything from how are we dealing with, you know, trade remedies, anti-dumping? How are we dealing with the de minimis? What should we do about the new legislative 21 CCF framework from, you know, what should we recommend? I was very involved with that. The Centers of Excellence, um, export modernization, just a lot of cool stuff that they're working on. Well, with that, let's stop for just a second. So, uh, you know, to our listeners, again, if, if you're not familiar with COAC or maybe you have heard people reference COAC, and as he just said, as Lenny just mentioned, it's a group of basically private sector working with government. So it's a, you know, private sector government initiative. And it's, again, dealing with issues is whatever. It is like a formalized sounding board for the government, for uh, customs and other agencies potentially, but mainly customs. What if we're thinking of this? Let's work this out. Is this good? Or, you know, here's the idea and the concept and the proposal. Can this be hammered out? And and it gives those that are in the industry that are, have, shall we say, very seasoned, uh, have a lot of good experience, have a lot of good knowledge, and and are able to make comments and work that kind of stuff out. Would that be a good synopsis there for COAC for those? Completely. Yeah, it really is that sounding board. And we're, you know, the I like to think of COAC as being the biggest fans to tell them what customs and Homeland Security are doing well. And frankly, the biggest critiques, it's like you're going back to the family concept, right? You got to hear, hey, what am I doing well? What am I doing bad? And we just put it on the table. So it's really cool. And you do get to see some of that four times a year. They're required through the um, charter to have four public meetings, usually two or three are in D.C., but then they try to go out to other ports of entry uh, to involve the community. Some people say, uh, you have it all figured out by then. Like everyone's just saying, oh, we agree. That's nice. We're all one happy family and there's no contention. Well, that's because a lot of the details are ironed out beforehand. So the public meeting, people think it's kind of like almost a, you know, a nicely scripted, you know, presentation. But once in a while, someone will throw a little comment in there and we like that. But um, that you do get to see that part of it publicly. Okay, so let's look at it this way, is that if somebody wants to, I guess, get up to speed and keep track of what COAC is doing, um, Lenny, where should they go? What, what should they be looking at? Yeah, what you could do is you could just go into your browser and put CBP COAC and they have their own page. So there's actually a COAC page at cbp.gov. And if you put in the words COAC, cbp.gov, it should come up. And you're going to see the various subcommittees, working groups, recommendations. The idea of COAC each quarter is to come out with recommendations from these various working groups that then are presented to CBP, Homeland Security, and Treasury for hopefully their agreement and to be implemented down the road. They aren't always agreed upon. They aren't always implemented, but at least you'll get some type of response and know if it's a thumbs up or thumbs down. And you could see all those materials going back a few years at the COAC page. All right. With that, let's move into scenarios. What would be, let's say, maybe the top... You, you rattled off a lot of stuff, and, and I don't know if we can get into all of them, but maybe let's talk to start off with what would be the top, you know, three or five, uh, shall we say, issues that COAC is looking at right now? Or or for that matter, what, let, let's, let's back up. Let me, let me back up one more thing. It's either COAC or what would you say would be the top three or five issues in the importing and exporting community? Sure. Um, I, as far as, you know, from a strategic standpoint, and I, I like to try to 
you know, provide to the trade community a little a peek, if you will, of what's ahead, you know, and where it's going. Because I think you go to a GTEC conference or an NCBFA conference, AI, you're going to hear a lot about, again, what are we doing about the China 301 and the anti-dumping and forced labor? You know, and we know those are we're dealing with those and contending with those now. And those are always going to be issues. I think what's, you know, forward thinking strategically really interesting, exciting, first off, is the 21st century customs framework, right? What does that really mean? Well, I mentioned when I was working at customs in the 90s, the Customs Modernization Act or the Mod Act hasn't been updated in 30 years. So we have all, we're in this whole new world now, right, guys? When it comes to trade, there's artificial intelligence, there's blockchain, aka digital ledger technology, right? And we're getting data from all these, potentially from all these different sources, all these different parties, not just the importer, not just the broker, not just the express carrier, but maybe it's from the wellhead, from you know where the where the oil or the pipeline's coming from. Maybe it's from the cotton producer or the cotton farmer on the other side of the world. Is there a way to get that data earlier on in the process to customs, right? So they kind of have a they have advance notice as to what's coming in, could process the entries quicker and maybe avoid going back to the importer and saying, could you let me see if you qualify for this trade agreement? Let me see if there's no forced labor here. Let me make sure there's no anti-dumping. If you're able to get those data elements earlier on, on either an entry basis or even a product specific basis, that's what 21st century is about. Harnessing that data from the right parties, the right time, at the, the right point in the transaction, even prior to an entry, but then still maintaining, and this is important, the traditional parties, that you need that importer, that broker, those couriers, the express folks to have that right to make entry to say, now we're certifying it. Now we're saying, okay, we're going to lock that in. And here's our declaration because some of the data, you know, might be a little scrambled or it might not tell the whole story. So it helps, but it might not really put it in that final ready for prime time move. So that's a, a little bit about what the 21st century customs framework is so that the legislation allows customs in the trade to provide that advanced earlier data and use it in a positive facilitative way. Well, but also to a point is one is I think it's fantastic to get the information and make it available as early as possible to customs and the, and the governing agencies. But two, as you just said, sometimes it comes in and, and maybe the information is fragmented or, or whatever. And, and, and so you're providing at the time as much as you've got, but it could be incorrect. So being able to then, Oh, Hey, we've got a better declaration here or more details. Now I'm able to supply information again before arrival way ahead. But be able to update the file to customs without them coming back and, and, you know, penalizing you over it or something. It's like the objective is, you know, giving the governing agency the ability to review things from a cargo security, from a economic protection scenario and all those kinds of things. Would that be fair? That's right. That's right. And when you and when you talk about security and economic protection, you're going to hear this phrase a lot. Here's my prayer. If you were to say, Lenny, what's the phrase we're going to probably hear the most of in, in the next year? I think one is going to be green trade, all right, which we could talk about a little bit, but relevant to this, leveling the playing field. There's a lot of discussion about leveling the playing field from the administration, Congress, and, and CBP and DHS. And what that means, Andy and Lalo and folks that are listening, is how do we take that haystack and make the haystacks smaller? So we could find the needle because, yes, we're going to facilitate the good folks who are providing this data in advance. But on the other hand, there may be some needles that we're going to detect in that smaller haystack of the folks who are not providing the data earlier or providing wrong data or data that's questionable. So CBP doesn't focus on the waste their time focusing on the compliant people, but focusing on the problematic people so that we level the playing field to an extent, and we are able to have that enforcement activity brought against the proper parties. And we're able to facilitate transactions from those from our allies. You've heard a lot, another uh, phrase, ally shoring or friend shoring so that we know from a security standpoint, hey, this is coming from, you know, one of our longtime trade partners, probably less of a risk. 
oh, well, this is coming from a, a country where we have some trade issues and we have various types of trade remedy programs out there might be a problem. Now, this one looks like maybe it's trans shipping or it's going through a, 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 another country and they're saying it's coming from a trade partner, but it's really not. How can we take data to attack those circumvention type issues as well from folks who really aren't looking out for the best interests of our country? So there's kind of a yin and yang to it, a facilitation piece and enforcement piece yes. under an intelligence piece. Okay, to that point, the one thing, I mean, this gets back into – uh, an incentive, again, uh, you know, in theory, the incentive is to become CTPAT certified so that if I'm a uh, uh, an individual, I want to show customs that I am a good corporate citizen. I'm crossing the T's, dotting the I's. I've put in the appropriate security measures for my cargo. I've vetted the, uh, the parties to the transaction. I've vetted those that I'm dealing with and uh, on and on and on. Okay, that's fine. The question, and it has, it's been arguable that to go through all that to become CTPAT certified, there's, there seems to be still a dissension as to, um, shall we say, how much freight is actually uh, flagged for exam versus being streamlined. So what about dealing with that? Because, again, I, I like the concept. I think it's fantastic if I'm a good corporate citizen. But there seems to be a disconnect somehow that why is it that people are still not feeling like they're gain, gaining the benefits that they thought uh, were coming from CTPAT or whatever? Yeah, that, that's been a big question. You know, I was on one of the working groups, and this is another piece of COAC, the CTPAT benefits, right? How do we build more benefits into it? What's going to hit and improve the bottom line? Um, one of the ideas floated around with 21st century CIA, uh, customs framework goes to that. Should we give a reduction on the merchandise processing fee? Because you're a CTPAT member. Arguably, if you're a CTPAT good member or partner, probably less work on CBP to process your cargo because they don't have to worry about it as much. The bad guys who are, I shouldn't say bad guys, but the questionable folks who are out there, that's really where they have to devote their time, hence a processing fee. That would be a game changer because it's a financial incentive. Are the containers being moved out of the port quickly, avoiding the high detention and demurrage because of CTPAT? Depends who you talk to. You know, a lot of companies say I'm doing okay. I think the the end game here is how do you, with all of this, but CTPAT's a good example how do you develop a partnership program, but across the government, like one USG partnership? How do I become a partner not only with CBP, but also with FDA and EPA and consumer product safety? How do we get them to, we, we feed them, if we're going to feed all this data to customs, shouldn't I basically have my one USG, one US government all clear without the threat of redelivery? within 30 days. So I'm all good to go. Everything's to market. And how do I sign up to say, hey, I'm a partner. I'm a partner for EPA, FDA. I want you to note that on my transactions. So that's why, Andy and Lalo, I think we have to make it broader than just CBP to really see some benefits. That would be one of those that I think is is fine. There was a an, an initiative a while back. I think it started under Burson when he was uh, acting commissioner. It had continued on for a while, and that was – and I forget the name of it, so forgive my, uh, you know, my ignorance here. If I, um, it, it was like there was a coalition of the different agencies that would come together. CBP was leading the effort, but had those uh, different agencies come together, and they were trying to move through issues. Now, that was not – that there was – there were guests – asked to attend from the private sector, but that was a internal government coalition. Is that still going on? Anything kind of effort like that? So think of you ever use a pen, the BIC pen, it's actually known as the BIC, right? However, it's B-I-E-C. So it's the Border Interagency Executive Committee or Council, the BIC or the BIC. And it, I call it the United Nations of the cross-border agencies. They all come together. Sometimes they let people from the private sector get involved. Um, it, people were complaining. It's kind of closed door. We want it to be more open. We want more input. They tried putting it into the COAC and the um, one USG interagency group for a little bit and having 
you know, those people, those agencies participate. But what's exciting now about it is that uh, the draft uh, discussion legislation is actually trying to codify that and put that into law. Because remember, Andy and Lala, this came out from what's called an executive order from the president, from the Obama administration that said, you will have this BIC, you will do this as an executive order and you will automate an ACE, but that's an executive order. So the thought is, let's get it in the law, let's require it, let's mandate that it reports through, you know, to the trade community and the other government agencies. And at the same time, maybe it's time for another executive order for a double double whammy here and say, and we're going to charge as the administration, we're going to charge uh, the various agencies and departments to activate this even in a more robust way than it is now. So it's there. I wouldn't say it's overly active, but I've had the opportunity to meet with the big members on several occasions, and they're excited about having one platform uh, for all the agencies through the ACE system as we approach ACE 2.0 and the 21st century customs framework. For our listeners, I will say that with all this that you're listening to, this is going to be a show you probably need to go back and listen to again, I hope, and and pick up on some, because there's a lot of deep stuff here that Lenny's mentioning. But in that, if you have a question and you're missing it or whatever, send a note to myself or Lalo, or, you know, and we'll forward it on to Lenny or, or whomever, and, and we'll kind of guide you in the right way uh, to, to get involved. Because I... Look, I personally had the privilege of uh, uh, working on, I guess, the biggest group that I dealt with was the Entry Simplification Working Group. And that is what re-engineered the current, uh, is now the current entry process with some absolutely fantastic people that, let me tell you, we did not get, uh, we, we did not see eye to eye we didn't uh agree on everything but and there were some intense debates but it was a great situation that we kept our eye on the on the end game here and i see that same kind of effort that is going on in trying to make things better for the industry um and, as a whole and and uh even for the government and all that so get involved look at it and go from there i want to tell you we need to talk about a few more things but it's like a you know it's like we've already been talking for a while here so i think lenny we're going to need to have you back on a on on some more issues if you're open to that my friend i'm always open to talking uh with you guys and with the trade we could talk about uh um, speaking of previews, what's going on with the centers, the centers of excellence and expertise, people have to think about that. What's going on with um, anti-dumping, countervailing duty, China 301, you know, the whole trade remedy piece. I think that's really key. And um, how are we going to modernize the revenue process? Just sometimes just paying bills can be really difficult and cumbersome as well. So there's a lot of these types of discussions going on that I think you're going to be hearing a lot about over the course of the next few months or year, including green trade and what that means for the folks who are listening. what How is that really going to change the equation? So there's always stuff to talk about with you guys and our friends in the trade community. Well, I appreciate you so much. Uh, folks, we'll have links to uh, Lenny's information on uh, our show notes and uh, and whatnot. Lalo, I got to tell you, this is going to be one that we definitely need to to promote out there and, and, and get together with this and, and, uh, uh, have some more, definitely we're going to book some more, uh, on, on these topics, maybe even have a panel of some folks to, to uh, that would be nice. That would be nice to have a panel. Cause, um, that way there'll be more discussion. And even if we have to break it up into two or three shows, I mean, who cares, you know, we'll, that, that, that will actually be really nice to, to have. Well, we need to get into some things where we can ha have some knockdown, drag out debates, and then at the end of the day, go, all right, we're all together on it. <laughs> I love it. Lenny, I appreciate you. You have been fantastic as always, my friend. And uh, Hey, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for the opportunity, and I hope we can do it again real soon. All right, for our listeners, one more time, thank you. We've uh, one year uh, under our belts. This has been fantastic. The whole series of shows that are coming, this is just the tip of the iceberg of one of them. And uh, we got some more surprises for you. Thank you so much for your listenership. Thank you so much for liking us, sharing us, and, and whatnot. Spread the word. And listen, we've hit a, over 10,000 downloads. We've hit over, I don't know, we're, we're approaching over 90 shows uh, being published, probably 
closer to 100 now. It's like, folks, it's all because of you. Thank you. So with that, Lalo, have a good day. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest in the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situation. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.